Well, campaigning against nuclear weapons has taken place since 1945, I mean, forever. But uh, there was like a lack of a coordinated campaign that collected all these different types of organizations and people into the same direction. So very much inspired by another Nobel laureate, the International Campaign to Ban Landmines, 20 years ago exactly that they won. We decided to do something similar to base our work on the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons and to push for a treaty that would prohibit nuclear weapons and, and unify civil society and help civil society work in the same direction. Uh, and and our, our campaign consists of so many remarkable people, passionate people from all over the world. And there's, there are activists that climb up on foreign ministries and drop banners and there are researchers that produce academic material or lobbyists in parliaments, a very wide range of things, but all trying to push for the same thing, a treaty prohibiting nuclear weapons and for the states to sign and implement it. It is important for civil society to work together because we are much stronger together and we can then utilize pressure from different angles, uh, from uh, on parliamentarians, from trade unions, from faith communities, from doctors, from um, experts and researchers and academics. It's if we can coordinate ourselves and the many different groups with the different constituencies and audiences that they have, we can really achieve this kind of shift of behavior that we're looking for. It's always a challenge to work with many different actors because it's people. You know, people are difficult sometimes. <laughs> um, the best thing about this job is all the people and the worst thing is all the people. Um, it's to, to be... I think the biggest challenge is really to work coordinated and disciplined but, without, but still allowing people to do their own thing and to have their own role. You need to have freedom to interpret the campaign in the way that fits your organization and your mandate and your views and your audience, but still have be connected to what everyone else is doing. So it's a little bit, uh, that's always a difficult balance, of course. But I think we're quite mindful about having the broad uh, problem, the humanitarian consequences, the solution, the treaty, and then let all of our partner organizations uh, do what they do best, their own work, and, and interpret this in their own context. The treaty, of course, it is um, a remarkable achievement, something that many said was not going to happen. They called us unrealistic and naive, and we got 122 states to agree to a treaty that prohibits nuclear weapons. It was really a fantastic moment, such a feeling of victory. The Nobel Peace Prize, second, it's pretty, pretty close to that. I mean, obviously it's much more attention, so it's a bigger thing like that, but really the, the remarkable thing was really the treaty and how we managed to formulate a plan um, already in almost 10 years ago. And there was no country that publicly supported this until 2013. So for many years, it was felt like hopeless and time, but we did the groundwork and we started preparing all of this. And then suddenly from 2013 and just and suddenly 122 states adopted the treaty that we have been fighting for. It was a fantastic moment for everyone around the world. There is one moment where I really knew that this was going to work. Because even I wasn't convinced in the beginning when I first heard that this we're going to ban nuclear weapons even without the nuclear arms states and it's going to have a great impact and it's going to be normative and it's going to work. And I was like, okay, let's do that. I'm not sure it will work though. But we were in Oslo for the first conference on the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons and we had this big civil society meeting and the then state secretary of Norway uh, came to speak to us and just the day before we had heard from the five nuclear weapon states that they were boycotting this conference. They were not going to participate in this. They were very angry. They had demarched the Norwegian government, said, we don't like this, don't do it. And we were very worried about how, it was the first time the P5 had ever boycotted something. 
and we didn't know how we would react, how the states would react. Nobody had ever tried to do something that they, they didn't approve of. And she came out on stage and she just, oh yeah, we heard that they, they came up and they were a bit angry, but you know, their arguments weren't very convincing. And the whole audience laughed. And I think that was the first time where I saw or felt the power dynamics shifting. Suddenly we weren't scared of them. They weren't in control, they weren't in power. We were going to do something with or without them. And that was going to be meaningful. And just that sort of simple power shift, suddenly this whole treaty, it clicked for me. That is how it's going to work. We are going to be in control. It's a bit like when people rise up against oppression or, or uh, people or undemocratic leaders. It only works as long as we don't dare to stand up and do it ourselves. But as soon as people uni unify and stand up there, it changes. The Nobel Peace Prize means so much for ICANN, not only as a huge sign and of the important work that we've done. It's tiring work to be a campaigner and you sometimes feel like you're banging your head against the wall over and over again. And you just, uh, it's little funding, you're being called idealistic, naive, it's never going to happen, why are you doing this, this is stupid. So it's a huge sort of feeling of revenge almost on all of those, the criticism and, and the, the difficult times that it has been to, to work on this issue. But it's also an enormous platform for taking this work forward. We are not done. This is not a, a gold watch you get when you retire. This is really a, a tool that we have to use now. So it's also a huge mobilizer and energizing factor for the campaign. And, and seeing all the people that came from ICANN to Oslo to celebrate this prize, and everyone was so excited about what we're going to do next and ready to get to work. And so many people are now contacting us and want to get involved and, and politicians want to meet. And it's it just giving us so much more uh, strength in the campaign. So it means everything to us. When I received the call, I thought it was a joke first. I wasn't sure it was real. So we had to watch the actual live show a few minutes later just to make sure that it was real. Um, and I also remember that he, he said that we had won and then he said now I have to go to the press conference and I'm going to hand you over to, to the people for the, that does the website. So they're going to do an interview. And I was like, I'm, I'm going to do an interview now? I haven't even understood what has happened. Uh, no, a, a huge shock and just a lot of honour and joy. There's so many Nobel laureates, and particularly the Nobel Peace Prize laureates, that have been uh, sources of inspiration for the campaign and, and for, for uh, me personally. You have, of course, our founding organization, IPPNW, won it in 1985. There's been many awards to the amaz amazing work that has been done in the past on nuclear disarmament. Alva Myrdal, Swedish uh, disarmament diplomacy. Uh, but also, of course, the international campaign to ban landmines. Uh, I mean, a huge, many of our partner organizations are also part of that campaign. So this is their second, in a way. So that's really, I mean, we work very similarly to them. But also, of course, Martin Luther King and Malala and all of these fantastic people that have received it. It's, it's a great, great honor to be, that ICANN gets to be a part of this historic list of people and organizations. It's, it's fantastic. We're building on their work. I've gotten the, uh, ICANN is, is building on to the work of previous Nobel laureates as well, both on justice, equality, human rights, and of course disarmament, uh, disarmament of uh, chemical weapons, landmines, and of course nuclear weapons. And sometimes I've, I've gotten the question now that you're one of many who have gotten it for nuclear disarmament and why will your work but not them but we don't see it like that we build on to their work they are a part of history and a part of this movement from the beginning and we have achieved great progress also because of those the work of them so it's it's really about always keep pushing and always keep fighting and and always uh, keep moving forward uh, we're not going to be done until nuclear weapons are done 
This Nobel Peace Prize is given to a bunch of ordinary people, many very extraordinary people, but ordinary people, that just got together to do something. Because doing something is always better than not doing something. Uh, even if it might not work in the end, or even if it feels like a very far away goal. Uh, getting together people to change something you're unhappy with is the only thing that has worked in history. Change doesn't just happen from the outside. It's not the politicians that decide to change the world. We do, and we make them change. And uh, we're living in a moment where it feels really dark and really depressing in many ways. But I think also for many people, this is the best time we've ever had for women, for people of color, for homosexuals that have all these rights now that we didn't have a hundred years ago. So I think we have to see the world also in a bigger context, that we are um, moving forward and we are taking steps. And this is a part, all these fights that we are fighting now is, is a part of that bigger fight for justice, for equality, for equal rights for everyone. And those victories come from uh, ordinary people just mobilizing and demanding change, saying stop, not anymore, now we'll change this. So I really hope that this is, um, is inspirational. Um, we're a bunch of people that did something the most powerful states in the world tried to stop. The richest, most military superior countries tried to stop it, but we did it anyway and we succeeded. The, it's been a really overwhelming week with so many big events. I think obviously the, the ceremony itself was very moving and very touching. And we, we, especially when we got, the, when Suzuki and I received the diploma and the award, uh, the medal. And just to see the, the joy in the audience in the front row was, uh, I can steer in group. Just behind that was my husband who has stood by me personally for so many uh, years in this work. And to see all of that um, joy and warmth, and to, I felt the audience was very much behind us. And that was a very overwhelming moment. I was very happy that John Legend then played a song so I could collect myself before the speech because I was really overwhelmed. First, I'm going to have a Christmas break. <laughs> I can is going to mobilize even more now. We have given a, been given an enormous platform. Uh, we have launched a 1,000 day fund, which is where we put the prize money. And that is going to be used to go local, go national. We are a big global campaign, but the actual work takes place on a national level. And we are going to make sure that this treaty enters into force within 1,000 days and that it has an impact, that it starts having a normative effect on states outside the treaty. So we're going to get states to ratify the treaty, we're going to start research projects on challenging those outside, get those outside the treaty to start signing it, and really just uh, keep uh, pushing this kind of work forward. So making this treaty an effective tool of international law, an effective campaign tool within 1,000 days. Yeah. There is a legend in Japan that if you fold 1,000 paper cranes, you are, you're granted a wish. And there was a girl who survived the bombings of Hiroshima, and, but she got sick in leukemia because of the radiation a few years later. So while she was sick, she started folding these cranes in order to, to um, get a wish and wish for to become well. And unfortunately, she died before she was done. So this has taken on a, a, a symbolic uh, part. So in Oslo, when we launched this 1000 day fund, we had 1000 paper cranes that were folded by children uh, from Setsuko Thurlov's high school, the school where she was when the nuclear bomb fell and where she crawled out from and survived. So they folded 1000 paper cranes from us. 468 of those has the name of each ICANN partner organization to really show that we are all here. I, me and Satsuko might have been on the stage in Oslo, but this was not our award. This was the award for all of those people around the world that have worked so hard for this.
So that's why we also donated the, these 1,000 cranes to the Nobel Museum here in Stockholm. Thank you.